Please be seated. Good morning, folks. Uh, before I lead in a word of prayer, uh, I'd like to just kind of give you uh, an update. Uh, so uh, Mike Shirtliff is over at New Masket Nursing Home, and uh, he's had better days, so continue to lift him up in prayer. Uh, the good thing is, is that Carol's getting some rest uh, uh, during this time, uh, so lift them both up in prayer as well. Uh, there's so many things uh, that are on your hearts, I'm sure. Uh, there's a lot of things that are on my heart. Uh, God knows them all. Nothing that you can't tell him that he doesn't already know. Amen. So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, what a honor, a joy, and a privilege to come before you this morning and to worship you. Uh, may our hearts be filled with great, great joy and great love and great peace as we come before you. Uh, we thank you, Lord. Uh, that you know all there is to know about us. Um, nothing has occurred to you in that regard. Uh, nothing has occurred to you uh, at all. Uh, you know it all, Lord. And we're humbled that you sent your son uh, to die at Calvary to uh, bear our sins, that we might bear his righteousness and be found uh, without fault and blameless before him. And we pray that uh, that would be true, uh, that we would be found in his love, uh, that we would uh, walk with you, Lord, and remain in your love, that we might be able uh, to share that, that, that perfect love with others that we uh, meet and encounter from day to day. Uh, so we bless you for your presence. Uh, we pray that your presence would be a great, a great comfort uh, to each and every one of us, Lord. And we pray that as we gather this morning, that uh, whatever weighs down our hearts, whatever distractions that might um, be presented this hour, this day, uh, that uh, you would remove them and that we would find great, uh, great blessings and great joy and great peace. Uh, we also pray, Lord, too, uh, that you would give us understanding uh, uh, with your word and with all things as we, uh, as we wait upon you. Uh, Father, uh, thank you that we could lift up Mike shirt lift this morning. Uh, bless his heart. Uh, give him a great strength. Uh, we pray that you would touch him physically. Uh, we also pray that you would give him great strength spiritually uh, as he trusts in you and waits upon you. Also, Father, too, we lift up Carol, encourage her heart. Uh, thank you uh, so much for Carol. Uh, also, Father, too, uh, think of uh, Fred uh, Legler, uh, Patricia Fogel, uh, the others, uh, Cindy, Cindy Ellis, uh, with great burdens with her family. Um, give them joy and give them peace. Sandy Sherman, uh, lift her up this morning as well. Uh, thank you, Lord, that uh, their times are in your hands, um, and may they be greatly encouraged uh, with the knowledge of that truth. Uh, Father, too, I notice that uh, Mim is not here today. Uh, we pray that you would touch her physically and lift her up as well. Uh, Father, also, um, we again lift up our country this morning, uh, great, great spiritual needs. And uh, Father, as I've prayed in public and in my uh, uh, prayer life, I pray that you would bring a spiritual revival. Uh, and, and if it doesn't start with uh, anyone here in this church or with me, I pray that it would start someplace and that, Lord, your spirit would sweep across our communities in this land uh, to be a great, great blessing in these uh, last days. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we pray that sincerely, O oh God, uh, you know our hearts, and we pray that you would 
create a revival. And as the songwriter says, let it, let it start with me. Uh, may it come to my own heart. Uh, we thank you uh, for this time. We thank you for meeting us uh, as we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, uh, we have our first reading of scripture. Dave? This morning's scripture reading will be from the book of Acts, the 26th chapter of Acts. And I'll be reading the first 18 verses of the 26th chapter. And if you're using a red church Bible, that starts on page 10. 85. Again, the first 18 verses of the 26th chapter of Acts. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Is it hard for you to kick against the gods? Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord stated. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and you will see. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from power, the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by their faith in me. May the Lord add his blessing. Thanks, Steve. Our second reading this morning is a continuation of the 26th chapter of Acts. It begins on page 1086 of the Bible, and I'm going to be reading verses 19 through 32. 
So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to, Jerusalem, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak, speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. They left the room. And while talking with one another, they said, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man would have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. This too is the word of our Lord. Let's give it this time to prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, whatever I say this morning, may it be uh, to the glory of Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. So folks, uh, as I turn to the book of Acts here, I don't even have my Bible open to the book of Acts. And that's what happens when you look at the screen, right? So uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, this morning I don't want you to be offended. Uh, but I do want to go on record. That's very, very important. You're crazy. You're all madmen and mad women. You're maniacs. You're insane. You're raving lunatics. And you may even have a demon. I want to go on record. Thank you. All because you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you came to church this morning just to hear that you're crazy. How uplifting and comforting that might be to your minds and your hearts this morning. Uh, by the way, uh, what's the old adage? It takes one to know one. I'm honored to be a part of the Madman Club. I'm in your club. I'm one of you. I'm a raving, crazy, insane, demon-possessed, maniac, and madman too. I too believe like you do. Aren't we glad we know each other? <laughs> Birds of a feather flock together, amen? amen? This is how the world looks at Christians. Did you know that? This is how the people of the world looked at Jesus. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 20, Jesus was called insane a maniac, and they accused him of having a demon. Mark chapter 3 verse 21, his family was told to come because Jesus needed help. Because he was saying to people, your sins are forgiven. So they thought he really lost it. And so they called his family to come and give him help. This is how Festus looked at Paul. He was charged with being mad for his Christian beliefs. 
Did you know, I, I came across an article online, 10 reasons why Christians are insane in the brain. Yeah, I think that's where it starts, right? It's insane in the brain. That's, that's where the mental disease starts. And, it, and the 10 points were actually laughable and funny, and yet by the same time, or same token, it, it, very, very sad. I thought, this person is totally devoid of the Spirit of God and has no future. Not all men have faith. Or women. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They were foolishness to him. They don't understand them. They're spiritually appraised. They don't have the Spirit of Christ and therefore they do not have the mind of Christ. Now, I, I have to tell you, I don't find this terribly disturbing. You know why? Because Jesus said, the world, he said, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they called him insane and a maniac, they're going to call you and me insane and maniacs as well, right? Demon possessed. What I actually find more disturbing is this. You see, in, a, in America today, there is a coordinated, concerted effort to brand Christians worse than being mad. It's not only being mad, you're a racist. Did you know that? You're also a racist now. You see, if you're mad and insane, then you cannot be taken seriously. You've got mental issues. You need help like Jesus needed help. But if you're a racist, this is intentional. This is not mental. It's a social disease, and you're a very bad person, and you will be taken seriously. You see the difference? And what I find terribly disturbing is that the media wants to lump all the Trump supporters and all Christians into the same category as racists. That's what I find disturbing. It's like killing two birds with one racist stone. It's maligning Trump supporters and it's maligning Christians. Now, truth be told, not all Trump supporters are racist. Uh, are there some? I don't know any, but I suppose there may be some. I don't know. God knows the heart. There's always a rotten apple in every bushel, as the expression goes. But then again, all Trump supporters aren't Christians. I am sure that there were many unbelievers who voted for Donald Trump. I ran into a few, I believe, I'm not passing judgment, just spiritual discernment. But I'm pretty certain that in the last several years, I've come across people that were Trump supporters that are not Christian. And, and by the way, not all Christians are Trump supporters either. Uh, the election in 2016, 80% of evangelicals supported the president. This past election, it was less than 80%. So you had some defections. I personally know some believers that did not vote for them. And I argued that they should. I argued that he wasn't racist. But that's the way he's been labeled. But see, here's, here's the thing. This real, none of this really matters to those who want to use the moral branding iron to Christians and Trump supporters at the same time. Christians and Trump supporters are mad, insane, and they're bad because they're racist. That's really all that matters. Because that's the political agenda, and that's the political message. Now you say, well, Pastor, what proof do you have that there's a coordinated and concerted effort by the media. Here you go. NPR, publicly funded by your taxpayer dollars. Article, July 2020, quote, this is the title, White Supremacist Ideas Has Historical Roots in U.S. Christianity. You see the link? Government funded. That, it was a hit piece, basically, on Christianity and the Bible in the South. The Bible Belt. Another hit piece entitled, quote, 
why white supremacists and Christian nationals tried to subvert American democracy. Here's a quote taken from the article. Quote, it is a last stand attempt of those who endorse a white Christian supremacist ideology to preserve power in a country that is becoming increasingly racial, racially and religiously diverse. In other words, white Christians can't handle it anymore. Uh, by the way, they're baseless charges. This is by an organization that's supposed to address division and racism in the country, right? Go figure. Washington Post article, August 2020, the title, How White Supremacy Infected Christianity and the Republican Party. Another hit, hit piece with baseless charges. You can go online and find this stuff. Uh, Washington Post, consider the source. Newsweek, consider the source. Here's the title, Trump supporters faced white supremacy radicalization. Okay, here's a quote out of that. Quote, much like global jihadist organizations that use seminal events to promote radicalization within individual groups, far-right organizations treat crises as opportunities to disseminate their radical ideology. Uh, I thought it was a Saul Alinsky plan by the left to use crises. If you were to change that quote and get rid of the far-right terminology and put far left in, then it would fit. That's what they do. It's comical. And by the way, this was written by somebody from the Near East Center for Strategic Studies, International Institute for Counterterrorism. So you see the correlation? Christians, white supremacists, jihadist global organizations. You're a bad person. Oh, and most of these are opinion pieces, by the way. But the point is, they put it in ink. Another NBC hit piece, September 2019. White evangelicals love Trump and aren't confused about why no one should be. Quote, modern evangelicals support this president. The support for this president cannot be separated from the history of evangelicals' participation in and support for racist structures in America. You're a racist. You're not only mad, but you're a racist. Because you're a Christian. You're all lumped into the same category these days. Now, this is all very rich, because, and it's actually laughable and comical, because isn't it the far left news outlets that promote abortion? And I reminded you months, uh, weeks back, that seven of ten abortions are black children. Oh, that's really rich, right? And then they've endorsed policies for 60 years that have done nothing for the black community except keep them down. You know, when you take money from the government, government handouts, they own you. Harold, you drove on the Indian reservations uh, five years ago with your sisters, drove across country. Harold said, you want to see poverty? You go to the Indian reservations. The cities are nothing. That's what happens when you take stuff from the government. They own you. These same organizations have kept status quo for blacks. The modern day plantation, all your American democratic cities, pretty much. And yet you're the racist. If I remember correctly, wasn't it the Democratic Party that was actually resisting the change in the South back in the 50s and 60s? So here's the narrative, folks. Christians are insane, Trump supporters, uh, Christians are insane Trump supporters who are white supremacists. Whether you voted for Donald Trump or not, if you're a Christian, now you're branded as a white supremacist. And so it sets it up quite nicely for their next agenda to come to censor more and more of the supporters and the church. That's where it's going. Don't you see that? I do. So back to the specific charge I started out with. You're a crazy, insane Christian, and now you've got the racist label to deal with. Uh, now, 
This is important because I don't presume, I'm conservative, I don't presume that everyone in here is conservative. But, uh, but you're a Christian. And you may not be a Trump supporter, but you're a Christian. And you may not be racist, but you're a Christian. And so here's, here's still the label. You're still a maniac. That's what you are. You believe in the Word of God. You believe in Moses. You believe in the prophets. You believe in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. You believe what the Apostle Paul believed. So if you're not conservative and you're not a Trump supporter and you claim that you're not racist, you're at least a maniac. Take a look at the movement here. Uh, and it's, this is a lot of verses of Scripture to get our arms around. But the movement is this. Paul gave a personal testimony. He proudly persecuted the church. He proudly killed people in the name of God. And yet he meets God. He becomes a believer. His life is changed. And he becomes a minister of the gospel. Now how do you explain that? except but God. And so he stands before uh, Festus and Agrippa, primarily speaking to Agrippa. He, he addressed Felix and Festus in chapter 25. But he appeals to the prophetic witness, the messianic prophecies, and he preached Christ crucified. This is too much for Festus. He's sitting there and he just lost it. It struck a nerve. Uh, Bill, you, you, you captured it quite ni nicely in his reading, where he shouted out, Paul, you're insane. And he goes into an, an ad hominem attack, a personal attack. Doesn't want to deal with the arguments, just a personal attack. And, and take a look at verse 24. You're great. Learning has made you mad. Now, this is actually, if you take a look at it in the Greek, it's a, it's a reference to higher learning. And there's the sense of turning the head to make one mad. Kind of like as you turn the books, <laughs> your, your head's turning mad. Now, there's only one problem with this. This deals with the learned Pharisee. You know, the crazed learned Pharisee? And yeah, but what does it do for the unlearned fishermen? You see? So let me get this right. When killing and persecuting Christians, he wasn't mad, and he wasn't out of his mind, and he wasn't out of his senses. He was just jealous, and he was carrying out his duty to God. But now that he's become a Christian, he's mad, and he's out of his mind. And we're not sure what kind of books Paul was reading. And we're not sure uh, of all the things he learned. But it made him mad. Despite the fact that he went to the very best Jewish schools. He had the best learning. Th does anyone see the irony here? There's a great irony. You, you go up to Harvard, go down to Yale, visit Princeton, or find your way to Columbia. It's all noble and higher learning, is it not? It's Ivy League schools. And yet, it's divorced from God. Right? Used to, used to be, or they were all founded as Christian schools, but now it's been separated and divorced. Now it's higher learning. You see? Man knows better. Now you're not mad, you're educated, you're learned, you're well-grounded and groomed for life, right? But you believe in the Word of God, and you're a madman. You're a maniac. You believe in the resurrected Christ, and you've got mental issues. Yeah, you know, I was, I'm glad I have mental issues. Aren't you? It's great to have mental issues. <laughs> the Word of God has made me much wiser than all the graduates of the Ivy Leagues. And he's made it you much wiser too. I've been called a lot of things, never accused of being smart. I would never make the Ivy Leagues, never. Not even interested, to be honest with you. I've been accused of being mad. 
like insane, angry, well, not really insane, but mad as in angry, accused of raving. My kids know that, and my wife knows I rave from time to time, uh, but have never been truly accused of being insane. And yet when I take a look at what's happening in our society, I'm coming close. Some days I just want to pull my hair out. Right, Carol? It's insane. Not because of my Christianity, but because of the world in which I'm living in. I, you can't make this stuff up. It's insane. And it's got nothing to do with believers, folks. What they accuse you of what they are and what they're doing, they accuse you of what they are and what they're doing. That's exactly what they do. That's mental. That's truly mental. I can't figure it out. It must make them feel good or something. I don't know. Back in 1963, uh, they made a classic movie. It's called The Mad, 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 Mad World. Did you ever see it? Classic. I love it. I love it. It's a classic in our household. All-star cast. Jimmy Durante, Jack Benny, Sid Caesar, Jonathan Winters, Ethel Merman, Phil Silvers, Buddy Haggett, Mickey Rooney, Jerry Lewis, Spencer Tracy. Some of them make cameo appearances, right? Great clean movie. Uh, a bunch of people are trying to find hidden treasure. It's, it's actually comical. Rent it. You can probably find it on, you know, Amazon or whatever. Google. Uh, folks, it's mad, 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 mad world. You can't, you, you, you need to add more mads to it. Four is not enough. But if you look to and trust in a Savior who came from heaven, who promise you, promises you eternal life, a resurrected body, life and peace and joy forever in his heavenly kingdom, forgiveness of sin, you're crazy. Festus is unhinged here, and yet Paul is calm. Bill, you also brought that out, too, very nicely. It's kind of, kind of ironic, isn't it? Festus loses it. He's not even being spoken to. And Paul keeps his composure. That ought to tell you something. Uh, Noah Webster in commenting on this verse. Uh, and by the way, this guy, I've been reading the, this book that Harold gave me, and this guy was anything but calm and composed. Uh, he failed at virtually everything he set out to do. He was a lawyer who struggled to make a living. He fell in love twice but was rejected. He was passed over to write Washington's official biography. He struggled to pay his bills and put food on the table. Uh, in working on a dictionary of the American language, ultimately known as Webster's Dictionary, um, the mental strain and financial worries and constant criticism nearly broke him. That is, until he came to faith in Christ. His brother criticized him uh, for his religious enthusiasm. By the way, that's the same word that's used in Acts 12, verse 15, where the girl runs to the window and she sees Peter, says, oh, I think it's his angel. And they said, you're crazy. It's the same word, right? So basically his brother was calling him crazy, enthusiastically crazy. He said, after I accepted Christ, from that time on I had perfect tranquility of mind. He wrote his brother and said, quote, These sediments may perhaps expose me to the charge of enthusiasm. Of this I cannot complain. When I read in the Gospels that the apostles, when they first preached Christ crucified, were accused of being full of new wine, when Paul was charged by Felix with being a madman, when Christ himself was charged with performing miracles through the influence of evil spirits, if therefore I'm accused of enthusiasm, I am not ashamed of it. It is my earnest desire to cherish evangelical doctrines and no other, for nothing is uniform but truth, nothing unchangeable but God and his works. To reject the scriptures as forgeries is to undermine the foundation of all history, for no books of the historical kind stand on a firmer basis than the sacred books. 
The, the word of God changed Noah Webster's life. And hopefully it captured the, the heart and the mind of his brother. Who knows? God knows. John MacArthur, with a touch of sarcasm, captures the mindset of Festus, the Roman governor. By the way, Festus would be the equivalent to Pontius Pilate. Okay? MacArthur says, every, quote, every intelligent Roman knew that dead men do not come back to life and talk to people. Therefore, Paul's mental musings must have caused him to lose touch with reality. Uh, folks, uh, we have a Roman mindset in our culture today. That's what we have. Dead men do not speak. Dead men do not come back. This is preposterous. They deny the historical record. Uh, what, what do you do with the recorded testimonies of Moses and the prophets and how messianic prophecies 700 years before were fulfilled? What do you do about the testimony of the gospel writers? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I've always said this in a court of law. If I bring four people in, I'm either convicting somebody or I'm getting acquitted. Right? And what do you do with Paul's testimony and my testimony and your testimony? What do you do with it? Listen, if the church is a movement that started with a dead man, then why does it continue? Why are there living testimonies to a living Savior? You ever ask yourself that question? Felix... Festus and Agrippa were all familiar with the Christian movement. It's right here. This was not a fringe movement, folks. It comes right out of Judaism, as you may know. But it was a despised movement. And your faith in Christ today is also despised, whether you realize it or not. Take a look at verse 26. Paul, before Agrippa, says this was not done in a corner. He was complimenting Agrippa and Felix and Festus for knowing, for knowing that this movement wasn't done in a corner. Uh, it was a compliment. It was akin to saying, you know, Agrippa, you didn't stay in your ivy, ivy, ivory tower. You didn't, you didn't stay there. You're not unaware of what's going on under your jurisdiction. Take a look at verse 20. The king knows about these matters. Take a look at verses 2 and 3. The king is an expert in Jewish customs and issues. He's plugged in. Verse 27. The king believes in the prophets. They were administrators. They were politicians. They knew what was going on. It was their job to know. And so... The account has it here where Paul corners Agrippa with all this. A message of truth and light. Old Testament truth. Resurrection hope. A personal sighting of Jesus Christ. And take a look at verse 28. This is, this is Agrippa's response. In a short time you will persuade me to be a Christian. Now when you read that, you think, oh man, this went right to this guy's heart. No, actually it probably didn't. Uh, this is not understood to be a serious response if you really work the Greek a little bit here. Basically, Agrippa shucks and ducks a response. He doesn't want to give Paul an answer. When Paul says, I know you believe, he doesn't want to say, yeah, yeah, because now he's trapped. He doesn't want to do that. What he does is he actually volleys and parries back. His response is really not legitimate. It's like, uh, in a short time you're going to convince me? Yeah, I don't think so. And, the, and the, remember, the, the word Christian is a derogatory term in this day and age, right? So Paul understood what he was saying. Uh, this is why Paul said, short time or long time, I wish that you and everyone else would come. Because as a classic politician, Agrippa was dismissive of it, played both ends against the middle, just playing the political game. That's all he was doing. 
take a look at verse 25. Paul stated that he was not out of his mind, that he spoke sober truth, that is truth, and he was rational. He proclaimed the life and light and truth of Jesus Christ. He spoke rationally. Folks, what I am saying here this morning is rational. Our country is not having problems because of racist structures. We're having problems because we've disregarded the Word of God. We're having problems because we've turned away from God. That's being mad. We live in a country where leftist ideology is destroying any Christian foundation of life, light, and truth that was laid by the Founding Fathers. You know that. If you do your homework, you know that. You know, there's this big thing that, uh, you know, churches shouldn't get involved these days. Don't be political. It's destroying your life and your society. That's why you're all stressed out when you watch all the riots. Because they're not, they're not letting up. They want the fight. They're destroying anything that relates to the gospel, anything that re relates to the Constitution, and anything that relates to govern, being governed. That's what it is. Is America perfect? No. Our church is perfect? No. Our people perfect? No. We all have flaws. But I'm not racist. I know you folks are not racist. I don't believe the church is racist, and I don't believe our society is racist. You can become anything in America if you want to be. Now, were people treated unfairly for a long time? Yes, very, very much so. And that was wrong. But I don't believe that we have racist structures in place. Danny and I have talked about this. Drew and I have talked about this. Bob Gannonway and I have talked. Harold and I have talked about this. Carol and I have talked. When, when, they, when they want to distract you and they want to get something, they always play the race card. Remember that. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13, Paul was defending, this is, this is precious, he was defending his apostolic ministry, and he told the Corinthians um, that he and those who ministered the gospel both to them, he says, if we are beside ourselves, that is the same word, if we're maniacs, if we're insane, then, we're, then we are insane for God. That's what he said. And he went on to say, and if... And if of sound mind, then we're of sound mind for the church, for you. That's, that's it in a nutshell, folks. Insane for God, but of sound mind for you. That's how I see myself. You're insane for God, but you have a sound mind and sober truth for other people. That's how I see you. Let them think that we're all madmen. I don't really care. But I would say like this, with Paul, may we say to them, I wish that you were all like me. Mad. Be bold in sharing. Persist in your witness, even if they think you're crazy. Invite people to a decision for Jesus Christ, like Paul did with Agrippa and Festus. That's what salespeople do, don't they? they? They try to close the deal. But be sensitive to the way the Holy Spirit's leading. But invite people to make a decision and to become a mad person like you. It's all good. To be mad like Jesus, to be mad like Paul, to be mad like your pastor. It's all good. Stay insane for God. It'll serve you well. Because this is all coming down. He's burning it all up. And that's not, that might sound depressing, but it's true. 
And we look for a heavenly city and builder whose maker is God, like Abraham. That's what we do. If that's insane, then count me in. I'm good with that. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we uh, count it an honor uh, to be like Jesus and to be uh, called the things that Jesus was called and Paul called. And we bless you um, for the testimony that we have and the witness that we have. And um, may you give us the boldness and the grace uh, to say to people, oh, that I wish that you were all like me. Uh, we uh, uh, pray, Lord, that we would be uh, insane for you, that we would stay insane for you, and yet be of sound mind when we share the gospel of Christ and the truth as it is in Holy Scripture. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.